I, uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And uh, this is, uh, I've only done this one other time, uh, presented this lesson in this format. I, I, I preached this in a series of 11 lessons at St. Augustine Road. You're going to get them all tonight. Um, I won't be 11 hours, I promise. Um, I did uh, this lesson at Dasher, and I did go a little bit over. Um, and I tried to stop, and they wouldn't let me. They said, keep going. So uh, I'm not going to take a lot of a way of introduction. I do appreciate you having me come and Roger asking me to be part of this gospel meeting. Um, this is something very important to the Lord's work, uh, the topic of leadership, uh, understanding that the church is in dire need of leadership. Uh, one of the things that we hear when me and Roger go to Polish in the Pulpit or the Fried Hardeman Lectures, they'll always be lectures upon this, the greatest need in the church. And it always comes down to this topic of leadership. Um, we as men are not stepping up to the plate. We're not taking on the role of leadership as we should. We're not doing what we should be doing. We're not learning what we should be learning. We're not preparing ourselves to lead the Lord's church. And I don't know of really any other better scripture in the Bible that really relates more to that topic of leadership and what leadership looks like is we look at God and His leadership. And, and we're going to be looking at the 23rd Psalm. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to there. And what I would like to do tonight is to give you maybe some in-depth of this passage that maybe you have not thought of before. Um, we're very familiar with this. I, I, I can almost guarantee you that if I said, let's quote this together, we could pretty much probably do it. This is a scripture that uh, I'm sure as you sang, uh, the song uh, that we just sang a minute ago, it's very familiar to you. Um, these thoughts and these ideas presented by um, David in, in this 23rd Psalm. David would be someone who knew something about shepherding. Um, and the idea of the first century elders being um, compared to and, and, and used as the idea, the concept of shepherding the flock is not something unique to God. It was his plan um, that he was going to have leadership that would treat the sheep, the children, the, 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 the church of, of God, the ecclesia, the called out. They would be treated as if they were sheep and you would have shepherds who would oversee that. And, and I hope as we get through with this thought tonight that you'll, you'll really have a deeper understanding of what David was relating to. And, and, and one of the things I want to, uh, as I start out here in, in, in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 1, I, I want you to think of this, and we'll mention this a couple of times tonight. This first verse or two is, is in relation from the sheep to the, the sheep across the fence. Okay, I want you to visualize there's a sheep and there's a pen and these sheep are looking across through a fence to other sheep on the other side. And I want you to think about this. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, he's not your shepherd. He's my shepherd. And think about that in a boastful way, because I think that's what David's trying to relate to us. I I'm sorry that you're out there. I'm sorry you're stuck with the shepherd that you have because the Lord is my shepherd. And when we understand the Lord is our shepherd, we understand a little bit better and we need to understand who the Lord is. You know, and, and we think about Lord God, the Father, and, and Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the, the, the one that is really um, relating to us today. Um, I, I heard this and I'd never thought about this before. Um, we're, we're studying a book right now in our deep study class brought by Brother Jimmy Jividen, the, the book on the Holy Spirit. And, and, he, and he relates in there, there's really been three periods. You have God dealing with man, okay, up until the point of Christ. And then you have the period of time that Christ deals with man. And then you have Jesus saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to send a comforter. And he's going to comfort you. He's going, to, he's going to bring you into all truth. And so now we have, and we live in, the time of the Holy Spirit. We have the words that we have had written to us. So we can look at that. And so there's, there's really three dramatic time periods. And when you realize, when we think about who our Lord is, and who God is, and what He has done for us, the Creator, 
the, the artist, the, the, the creator of all things. And, and Jesus is part in that, that nothing was created without him. You know, he's pretty much putting on canvas all the thoughts of God. And I think about the Holy Spirit as he reveals this truth to us. It, what a great idea that the comfort is going to come to you and he's going to present all truth to you. We have it today, do we not? Amen. And so understanding what their roles are in our lives, we really can say, man, I'm glad the Lord is my shepherd. He's the right shepherd for me. He is the one who created everything. He is the one who made everything. And he is the one who comforts me today. And so the first thing I need to understand is, who is the Lord? But then I need to also understand the concept that David is putting forth here. The Lord is my shepherd. What, what a beautiful relationship that that is. When, when you think about this relationship, it's, it's almost like we can see in, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, where, where, you know, if you as fathers give good gifts, how much more could your heavenly father, who gives you the Holy Spirit, thinking about that relationship of what we actually have, Jesus in, in, in that actual text, I think it actually says evil gifts. Your earthly fathers, they think they're doing well and they give you evil gifts, but your, your heavenly father gives you good gifts. He gives you the Holy Spirit. You think about that relationship, what we have with, in this shepherd and, and the sheep arrangement. What he does for us. But the thing that we need to understand is, is there is a working relationship there. And I think a lot of us fall way short when we, when we understand that this is a working relationship. You think about a sheep and a shepherd, if you've never seen, um, I know they'll have over um, this month over at the, the expo, they'll have these dogs out there working sheep. I've, I've sat there and watched them before. I think last year we watched them a little bit. And, and it's amazing to watch them do that. Well, you know, that's gone on for centuries. And that, and that shepherd will stand out there and he'll, he'll give signals and for those sheep to respond. But there's a working that goes into that. And I want us to think about, as we're talking about this tonight, the underlying basis of what our lesson is, is on leadership. And understanding that this shepherd has a job to do. You know, I, I think, I, I hate to say this, but I think we see this a lot of times in churches of Christ. We have a lot of elders and very few shepherds that are actually out there working. Working with the, with the flock, working with the people, know who they are. I, I talked to a guy who, who has done a study, and it's kind of an independent study that he did, and he talked to different people. And he, one of the questions that he would ask is he would, he would ask them, how many times in your life as a Christian has the elders, have the elders at your congregation been in your home, sat down with you, and talked to you about you? And it's almost 97% of the people that he talked to, the elders had never been in their home. The shepherds are not doing their job. How do you know your sheep if you're not among them working? This is a relationship. And so as leaders, we're falling woefully short on working and making this relationship actually be the way that it should be. We have a shepherd who has desires for us. He wants us to be saved. See, that, that's my Lord. You know, He doesn't want any to perish. He searches for me when I'm lost. Luke chapter 15. And He also, I need to understand, there are some people who believe that they have everything when they don't have the right shepherd. See, there are some people who base what they have, their happiness and their success, on what they've accumulated. Matter of fact, John addresses it, or Jesus does, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. You think you're rich. You know, those people thought they were rich, and he says, no, you need to buy from me the riches. Those things that are of value, that are of eternal value. That's what our shepherd gives to us. And that's why we do not have wants when we have the Lord as our shepherd. He provides those things for us. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know, sheep, because of their very makeup, it is almost impossible to get a sheep to lay down. 
I mean, it is, I mean, there are some parameters that have to be met for sheep to lay down. There's, there's typically four conditions that have to be met for sheep to feel comfortable enough to lay down. One of those, all four of those, one's fear, friction, aggravations, and then hunger. And it's interesting that the shepherd controls all four. He controls all four of those parameters to make the sheep where they will actually lay down. And David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Think about this for a minute. You think about how they train. You know, Jesus, as our shepherd, trains us to be free from fear. Let me relate this real quick, and then we're going to go into this. I have been in congregations, and I know Roger has, and some of you have, that I have gone in and I've, I've listened to some of their members talk. And I've talked to some of them. And I see and hear in their voices and their actions a very, very low ability and, and knowledge of God's Word. Matter of fact, I've, I have been um, places where Someone might come in and and they claim to be a member of the Church of Christ and they introduce me to a friend as, this is the pastor here. And and I know, I instantly realize that they're not as knowledgeable as they should be. And, And there's a lot of areas that I think about that. When you think about, that scares me. What are they doing in the world to teach others? What are they, and we all know the answer to that, they don't. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the ability to. They're scared because they just don't know God's word. And see, that produces fear. See, the shepherds are, remember what Paul would tell the elders at the church of Ephesus? Feed the flock. You know, that's the elders' responsibility. That's the leadership's responsibility to make sure that flock knows their Bible, knows the word of God. And so many times it's being neglected from leadership down. And we need to make sure we understand that sheep and people naturally are timid. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, when, when the Bible refers to us as sheep, it's spot on, I think. I mean, it, it is so, and if you've ever had sheep, and have ever been around sheep, I don't know how many of you have. I have. As a photographer, I was a photographer for 25 years. Every Easter, we started going and getting a baby sheep, and we would use it in our pictures. And so we would have this sheep, at, I don't know how old it was, a few weeks old. As soon as they would wean it, um, we would take it, and then we would bottle feed it, Bonnie was typically the feeder, um, and, and she would take care of the little sheep, and they're dumb as stumps. I mean, I've actually, y'all know where Central Avenue is, between Central Church of Christ and our old studio was the pink office right there. I've actually chased that stupid sheep down that Central Road in the middle of traffic because it just ran out there, and you stop and it stops, and you try to go get it, and it runs. I mean, he doesn't realize those trucks going to come through there and squish them in a minute, you know, but they're, they're just dumb. They're very timid. But see, one of the things that we need to understand as sheep, fear is something that makes us not comfortable, okay? Uh, It will make it where the sheep won't lie down. They they can't get their rest. They actually can't eat and feed as they should when when there's a presence of danger. And the shepherd protects them from that. Life is uncertain, but our shepherd is not. He never will leave us or forsake us. And so when the sheep recognize and they see that shepherd maybe off in the distance they know that 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 area that they are is safe and that they can relax it's also one of the things that that spooks sheep and then they typically are corralled at night is the darkness they're, they're they're a prey to everything i mean anything can kill them because they just they just they're just dumb and so they normally group them together. And so nighttime, you would always put them in a corral. And they, and they would find these all over Palestine and different areas where they would have sheep. The darkness is, is that which is, is when they're at the most vulnerable. So the shepherd would typically lay at the gate. And he would sleep at the gate to make sure nothing came in to get those sheep. And the sheep didn't go out. They would always do that. And I think about the protection of maybe the, the shepherd had a fire there maybe at night and had a, had a light. And I think about where Jesus says, I am the light. You know, and we, and we think about the comfort that we have in the middle of the midst of darkness, we have this light. And that is offered to us. Um, you know, there also one of the things that bothers sheep is friction. I don't know that if you've ever had this problem and you've had friction among the brethren. 
You've got some problems. Um, they call it in the, in the hen house a pecking order. Well, in sheep, they call it the budding order. They, they go around and they'll have some of the, some of the old um, sheep will go around and budding the younger ones. And they'll butt them and make them uncomfortable. They, they won't let them rest. And we've seen it with cows. I, we used to raise cattle. And, and they just go around constantly and they're kicking and punching and, and just stirring up problems. Well, the, the same thing happens in, in sheep. And, and they can't get any rest. This friction that they have there, but we need to understand that God hates bullying. And, and I say that in a way that I know we all hate bullying. That's kind of a big thing in schools right now. But, but we don't like someone who is trying to run roughshod. Third John talks about that, about diatrophies. Mm-hmm. Who's trying to, trying to push his way around. And I can remember in, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, where, where God steps up and he goes, I'm going to take in my sheep. I'm gonna, those of you that have been rutting and budding these other ones, and, and I'm going to put them in a, in a good field. They're going to have good grass. Because... He's talking about the religious leaders of the day. They weren't taking care of the sheep that they should have. But God takes care of those. There is a Christian order that we have. Not a budding order, but a Christian order. And the first shall be last. And and the the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, the meek, the merciful. Those types of terms that are used to describe those who are elevated in Christian life are not those who try to be the ones in charge but those who are the ones who serve, those who are meek. I like the idea that the less aggressive is the more contented. You know, what makes us contented in life? Those who who buy into this idea of it's not about me, it's about God. You know, the circumstances that I find myself in sometimes, when I am in dealing with folks and you will do this too as as you have dealings with people there's some times that people do some things that you're just not real happy about but see it really shouldn't matter what they do because what we do as christians isn't so much about what they have done to us but it's really about what god has done for us it's not really about and and i mentioned this this morning in our lesson it's not really about this horizontal relationship It's about the vertical relationship that I have with God. See, I'm supposed to be, as a Christian, that person that mirrors God in my life. So it really doesn't matter how well you treat me or how bad you treat me. I'm going to still treat you the way that I should because of what God has done for me. My shepherd treats me so that I avoid parasites and pests. You know, sheep have bugs. This is another thing that annoys them. Um, ours would get some stuff every once in a while and, and we'd have to maybe put some ointment or treatment on there. The shepherd is constantly watching for irritations. One of the things that the shepherd would do as the sheep come in at night, he would stretch out his staff. And not only would, would he count the sheep as they would go by, but he's closely looking at each one. And, and he would, they, would, they would come by and he would look and see if, if there was a parasite or something that was bothering that sheep because it would grow. And... and If I had my PowerPoint, I could show you some pictures of sheep who had, um, I think they call them scabbies or something, and and their faces were totally um, broken out, and and their their, their, uh, wool was was pulled back. But that starts somewhere. And the shepherd's job is to make sure he watches and he treats those when those occurrences come up. And and, and really, don't we have the same thing? What bugs us? What what bothers us? Isn't it my responsibility to look out especially those in leadership isn't their job to look out and see what's bugging folks what what's irritating them you know but you can't do that if you're not in their homes talking to them if you're not meeting with them if you're not spending time with the sheep we're reading a book right now um, in our elder training class they smell like sheep guess what you don't smell like a sheep unless you're around the sheep and so that's one of the things that we have to do we have to make sure the climate is right. You know, the shepherds are very, when the seasons change, the parasites grow more or less. And, and climate is very important. But the climate inside the church has to be right too. The climate for growth has to be right. I think about it sometimes as a greenhouse. What kind of condition do we have? Is, is there the right teaching going on? Is the, is the hearts the right soil that, that, that's ready to receive that seed and to grow? We have a part to play in that too. And then lastly, on that point, 
My shepherd toils so that I'll have green pastures. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Green pastures don't just happen. Okay? If any of you farms, you'll, you understand what I'm talking about. There's a lot of work that goes into it. There are a lot of weeds, poisonous weeds that affect sheep. That can kill them. And so the shepherds would go into these fields beforehand. They would go out before them and they would look and they'd pull up all the poisonous weeds and noxious weeds and they would throw them on rocks and they would die. And they would prepare that field. They would make sure that it was close to water because sheep need water. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. But the shepherds search out the best pastures. And I think about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. Speak the truth in love that they might grow. We, we as, as, as church leaders... Those who are looking to try to help the church grow have to make sure that we're giving them the right pastures to grow in. And it takes effort. It just doesn't happen. Uh, you know, I think about the wisdom that, that God uses in choosing Moses to lead the children of Israel. Now, you think about what he did before. He was a herdsman before. When he went down to Pharaoh and got the children of Israel and went out, I'm going to tell you, some of the areas that he took those children of Israel probably were places that maybe he had seen before. And maybe he remembered where the good fields were and the water was and things like that that they would travel to. The wisdom of the shepherds in going and preparing are so important. And I've got to go. I'm sorry. We've got to get going. He leads me beside still waters. Sheep are like people. We have a great desire for water. Um, the shepherds know where the good water is. They know. They've, they've searched it out. They, they know the areas that they can take the sheep into and where they can't take the sheep. Um, you, you realize the shape of a sheep and what they're made of wool. They get in water and they sink. Okay, They don't swim. And so this has to be, the shepherd has to be very careful about what water he takes them to. How important is it that we drink from the, the right water source as a Christian? The water that flows from Christ you know, Jesus would tell the woman at the well, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for the water that I offer. See, there's a difference. You know, sheep are, are pretty much like people. They'll drink out of anything. I mean, they'll drink out of um, puddles that, that 50 other sheep have already walked through and, and no telling what they've done in those paths that they've gone down. And, and sheep will just drink that. And, and we need to understand that if we drink from a wrong source... Illness can come to us. A lot of folks are taking in a lot of different stuff and they're getting their nutrition, water especially, from, from a bad source. I don't know how many people, uh, you're going to see this this week, There'll, there will be some who will decide to stay home and drink from the TV then come here and get living water. There are people that are going to make that decision. There are people that might have made that decision tonight. See, they, they don't really understand how poisonous that water is compared to the living water that is offered. Sheep are about made up of 70% of water. They have to have a very well-maintained water level or they'll die. And so the shepherd understands that. One of the interesting things, and, and, and I'm going to kind of go a little bit faster. One of the interesting things is in most of the areas that sheep are in when there's, when there's a lot of grass, they get water from three sources, a stream, a well, or dew. Okay, that's kind of the sources of water that, that shepherds have to choose from. Um, it might be some ponds and stuff, but um, in, in, a, in a water source like that. But one of the things that takes place, if you get the sheep up early and let them graze while there's dew on the grass, they never have to go to a water source. They get the dew off the grass, and that's enough. It's sufficient for them, and they can go throughout the day without having to go to a stream. Think about this for a minute. The wisdom of those who get up early. I tell you what, um, I was an hour off last week because I was over in, in New Orleans, so I'm an hour earlier than where you were here. Uh, it's about the only time that, that uh, Roger texts me, if he texts me early in the morning when he gets up and studies, that I was already asleep. I was still asleep. I'm normally up when he texts me early. Um, I know he's up studying his Bible early because he's normally waking me up sometimes. Um, thinking I'm already awake and, and I should be up studying, I guess. Um, and I think about Gus Nichols and, and, and some of those guy in woods who, who got up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and, and they studied their Bible till 10 o'clock every day. Um, uh, Robert Taylor Jr. Um, has read through the New Testament every month for I think the last 18 or 20 years, I think. Every month he reads through the New Testament. You've got to get up early to do that. But you're getting that which sustains you before you get out and go out to work. 
And, and you think about the value of that. Water alone that Christ offers is the water that satisfies. We don't get it anywhere else. It's the water. And He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You know, there are a lot of benefits to being a Christian. Um, I know I could ask each of you to give me some benefits of, of being a Christian. And, and you're going to say, well, we have prayer. And we have the grace and mercy and forgiveness. of sal-. All of those things are all there. And, and, and there's so many of those. And, and some that we forget. You know, we sing the song, Count Our Blessings. There, there are so many things that we have in Christ. Why would there ever be a need? And think about David's thoughts here. He restores my soul. David, you have the Lord as your shepherd. Why would there ever be a time that your soul would need be to be restored? Guess what? It just happens, doesn't it? I think about Psalms 42 and 11. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. This idea of restoring my soul carries with it the context of, of sheep being cast. Um, I don't know if you ever have seen that. Sheep will actually lay down. Sometimes they'll actually lay down to roll over to get rid of parasites and such as that. And they'll actually get stuck. It's called being cast. Um, they can't get themselves up. They're stuck. Um, I've seen pictures of them up against the fence. They were, they were actually with their feet were straight up in the air. And that's typically how they end up. You know the shape of sheep, okay? When they lay down, if they lay into a wallow, they will actually lay down in there and their feet will be straight up in the air. Now, that's cast. Uh, they need restoring. They can't get up themselves. There's no way. The other sheep will not help them. They're not designed that way. The only way they get from that position, from being cast, is the shepherd. He's the only one. And I want you to think about that for a moment. What the danger is when you have a sheep who's already very vulnerable, now they're laying in a position that they can't get up. If it's a hot day, they last maybe two to four hours and they die. Okay? If it's a winter day, if it's cooler, they might last all day. Okay? But eventually they have no mobility in their legs. They just can't, they can't walk. They can't do anything. So the shepherd comes out, and, and, and one of the, the books that I read about this, you know, they look out and they look across the field, and they see buzzards flying. And their heart, you know, is in their stomach while they race across that field to see if they found that sheep in enough time that they could save him. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. The thing about cast sheep is their intention is never to get that way. People can get cast. They can get to a place where their soul needs... And they, and they never intend to. It's not an intentional thing. Hebrews writer says that be careful and hold on because we slip away. It's not something that happens all of a sudden. Someone might miss a service or might miss two services. And, and then the next thing you know, something's happened and, 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 and we've lost them. We, we don't even know where they are. But the analogy of a good shepherd, a leader is looking out and, and counting the sheep. Which of you having 99 wouldn't go out? You know, sometimes we look at it and we go, hey, we got 25 here today. We're missing 25, but hey, we got the 25. Let's go. Maybe the 25 should go out and go, hey, let's go find those other 25. Amen. You know, we, we look at our numbers and what's happening, and we see this across the brotherhood. And not only the brotherhood, across religion in general, most most. Most denominations don't have services tonight. Guess why? They don't have anybody that comes back. And they don't care. Very few continue to have Sunday night services. We have numbers that are dropping every year. Why? It's because we've had cast sheep and no one has gone out and they have been devoured. They're easy prey when they're cast. We need our soul restored and we have... A shepherd who is looking to restore our soul. The producers of cast sheep. I want to run through these real quick for you. Sometimes the sheep are actually looking for comfortable places to lay. They're looking for those, those wallowed out places. The places where they can lay. And, and the bad thing is some of those places are the places that create the most danger for them. But aren't we like that too? We like to be comfortable. 
Um, I, I wrote an article um, for the Lamb magazine for the mission trip, and, and, and one of the statements I made in there is I, I'm really used to my real comfortable zone. You know, me going on a mission trip, I've been asked for 30 years to go, and, and it was tough. To, to, to finally say, okay, I'll go. I'll, 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 I'll go do what this guy did for years. Um, it was tough for me for some reason because I like the comfort that I have. You know, I like watching, even as bad as the Braves are, I like watching them, you know. I mean, there's things I like to do here. But that's what sheep do also. They look for those places that are comfortable. Discomfort sometimes builds a healthy faith. What does James says? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You know, sometimes we need to maybe be uncomfortable to see our faith grow, to see what we need to do as a Christian. Maybe we need to step out of those comfort zones, the, the safe bounds that we have and push what we do. Having too much wool is one of the things that causes sheep. The thing that they're of value to can actually be harm to them. Everything gets caught in their wool. You, know, you can imagine that, and, and they have to get them all sheer, but I mean, they'll have burrs and, and all kind of stuff that will just clog up in their wool, and that can actually be, get so heavy that, that they can't even carry it. What about us? As Christians, do we sometimes get so overwhelmed by things and the taking on of things that we forget what our really job and mission is about being a Christian? We get so overwhelmed with the world and collection of things that it becomes that which weights us down and inhibits our doing our job. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Sheep uh, are a lot like people. They are creatures of habit. How did you get here tonight? Was it the same road that you travel down every time you come here? Um, I, I get in trouble sometimes with my wife because I, I go a little bit of a different way than what she goes to the building. She goes the old way, um, and there's a train that can catch us every once in a while. I go the new way that, that we've spent millions of dollars building bridges over these railroad tracks in Valosta, so I go over those bridges. I don't get caught by the train anymore. And so sometimes she'll, she'll say, it's faster to go the other way. But I'm a creature of habit. I, I go these certain ways. Well, sheep are the same way. They get going down... They get going down paths, and they'll go down the same path so much, they'll actually cause erosion. Have you ever seen a cattle trail or a, a game trail? They'll actually cause erosion. And then when it rains, you've got other problems that come in. So the shepherd's job is, to, is really to diversify them a little bit, make them look at different things. If we get looking at the same thing over and over, we have a very limited knowledge of God's Word. You know, when, when Paul said, I, I declared the whole counsel to you. I presented it all to you. So we have some folks that, oh man, they really know this. And they might know this, but they really don't know the, the whole scope of the Bible. They don't really know the whole plan that God has put in place. They don't see it. They, they don't really understand the, the idea. And I, I, was at, I heard a lesson Sunday about this, and I loved it. I'd never heard this before, about the tabernacle. Of the, uh, of the old tabernacle and how it relates to the church. And, and I'd never thought about that before, but the basin was on the outside of the tabernacle. And you didn't go in the tabernacle, oh, no, if you went in without being washed, guess what happened to you? You were put to death, okay? God told Aaron, no, you, you wash out there before you come into the tabernacle. The tabernacle to us represents the church, right? You don't get into the church until you're washed, and I'd never thought about that before. Man, I'm going to start using that when I talk to people about baptism. When people say baptism is not essential. So wait a minute, do you not understand the types and any types of the Bible? But, but it's learning all the whole gamut, the whole counsel of God. Let's don't get so limited that we stay on these game trails because if we do that, we become like sheep and, and, and we're not seeing the whole story. We're not picking everything. Sheep sometimes struggle with following the shepherd. You know, that... <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine sometimes sheep wander away? Uh, and sometimes there has to be correction given. Um, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, Unless you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. You know, th there's, there's an idea in there about you've got to break your will. 
Shepherds will actually, uh, when they have a sheep who is, who is out of line, and, and he tends to stay out of line. Um, you know, they, they go rescue them and bring them back, and next thing you know, they're back over by the fence or by somewhere they shouldn't be. And when they see this, they understand a couple of things, a couple of principles. If you don't correct that before long, other sheep will follow them. And they have to correct that. So what they'll do is they'll actually break their leg. The shepherd will actually go and break the sheep's leg. And then he carries him. Because the sheep can't walk. The shepherd carries him until he's mended. What do you think that does to that sheep's dependency upon that shepherd? Do you think he ever has a problem ever not following the will of that shepherd again? See, he'll forget shortly about who broke his leg. But he'll understand who carried him and who got him through and who took care of him for all that time. And his reliance upon the shepherd becomes so much deeper. See, that's really the idea, the concept of what God wants us to do. He wants us to empty ourselves, to break us if, it, if, if we have that. Roger mentioned in this day of the class, we die Okay, and we rise a new man. Our will has to stay buried. But a lot of people today want to bring that person back around and give them CPR and drag this dead person around with them to resuscitate them later. That's not the concept of New Testament Christianity. It's to put that person to death and have a total reliance upon the shepherd. And when he leads me, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. But we must be willing to follow him. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know, the three verses is almost like, as I mentioned, the sheep talking to other sheep. They're bragging about what they have compared to what the sheep on the other side of the fence. Now we see a little bit of a change here, a personal relationship. You're going to see the, the words I, you, me, my. And, and we're going to start seeing this relationship change. You know, every mountain has its valleys, does it not? And when you think about this, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This path has to be travel. To get to the high ground, you've got to go through the low ground. But understanding that this is not talking about stopping there or dying there. The idea that David is relating to us is, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's a path that I must take. There are times that we're going to face things in this life. But we understand that our shepherd is with us. I will never leave you or forsake you. He's going to be with us through those times. And we get through those. And, and, and we need to understand the valley is not the goal, right? It's to get to the mountain. I don't know how many of you have ever been in the mountains. I, we go up to Kentucky and, and we, we ride four-wheelers. And we'll ride down in the valleys down there. But man, the coolest places and where your phone works is when you get to the top of the mountain. If we need to make a phone call, we got to go to the top of the mountain. Okay, that's where we get a signal. But uh, we love riding up there. Oh, the valleys are pretty. There, there's green grass down there. And that's one of the things that you, normally there's a stream in the bottom of the, the valley. There, there's, there's, some, there's some things that the shepherd can use to get you to the high point. It's not just going through this bad time. There, there are some good things that happen to us when we go through those. The valleys are always the best way to the top. If you've ever tried to climb straight up a mountain to go to the top, it's almost impossible. But if you follow the valley, uh, you go up the finger of the, the valley and you go up there, it gets a little bit closer to the top and then it's not so hard to get to the top. Along those trails that we travel, it's room for growth. Um, the, the, the sheep understand that not every shepherd is going to take them to the high ground. Only the great shepherds are going to lead their their flocks through the danger of the valleys, the things that they're going to face. Because see, down in the, down in the, around the house, around the farm, around the homeland, it's pretty safe. And, and, and you know what? Little effort has to be expended if I leave my sheep right here. But the, but the best grazing is on top. That takes effort and that takes work. See, a lot of times leadership is very comfortable. And, and you know what? If we just do what we've been doing, we're okay. We'll just stay right here instead of maybe encouraging, promoting, building, edifying, spending to get the flock to the top of the mountain should be the goal. 
It's God's goal. It's God's goal for all of us to reach the point that most or very few get to, right? Matthew chapter 14, 7, 14. When you think about that, few find that. There's a lot of folks that stay down low. But we have a promise of care. And in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 24, we have a promise of an, a reward of inheritance if we'll be faithful. And then let me quickly talk about the rod and the staff um, of the shepherd. They were, they were tools and they were also weapons. Um, the staff was to, had a crook in it and it would, it would pick up sheep that had fallen down. And, and they used it to count the sheep and to check the sheep. They checked their wool with the, with the staff. The rod was, um, oh, probably 18 to 24 inches long and it was a weapon that they could throw. Um, and they were deadly with it. Um, they, were, they could kill animals, wild animals, dogs and wolves and things with it, um, lions. Um, it, was, it was definitely a, a use that it could be used to protect the sheep. Those rods, they would have contests in, in, the, um, the, in the Swahili and, and in a lot of different areas. In Palestine and others, the, the, the shepherds would get together and they would have competitions. Who could throw their rod and, and have the best aim and do that? Well, those shepherds could, could throw those rods so well that even if a sheep got out of line, they could throw that rod and hit that sheep, not in a way to kill it, but enough to get its attention to get back in line. And you think about what God's word is. Isn't God word, God's word referred to as a rod? It, it guides us. It protects us. It, it actually keeps us from harm. It, it tells us how to defeat the evil one, staying away from him. But sometimes the rod has to be used in a way to get me back in line. It, it's used that way. And, 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 and I think that's very important when we... When we think about the rod and the staff, we need to understand that that is there for our protection, but also our comfort. And then thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, great preparation went into God's plan. Every aspect of God's plan was prepared before the foundation of the world. When you think about that, when he prepares a table before me, God knew what I was going to be facing in life. He knows what I'm going to be going through. And a good shepherd does that. He, he, he's, he's, he's actually gone out and he's searched and he's made sure that we mentioned a while ago that all the poisonous weeds are pulled and, and the dangerous um, limbs are out of the way so they won't be caught. And, and they don't take them near um, where there's a certain kind of shrubs that have uh, bugs that get on the sheep. They won't take them near those. They'll, they'll identify those. They might even mark them so they won't go close to those. It's interesting this table that he's talking about here. I have always wondered about that. When I think about that, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, I, I just never really could get that. But I want you to think about it a little bit differently. The word table here is actually, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word, but it comes from the idea we think of um, it, from a Spanish word, mesa. Um, have you ever seen out west and you see these... Um, these prairies, and all of a sudden you see this mountain that comes out, and then there's a flat, on, flat top on it. That, that's a table, okay? Mesas. Um, the Swahili word is mesa, okay? And, and so when you think about that, that's what David has in mind here. Not a dinner table. He's preparing a table, a dinner table for my enemies. He's saying he's prepared this high elevation place for me that I can go, and my enemies are all around, and they can't get there. They... they they can only look. And when I think about that, this is the idea. We have the right preparation goes into this table land that he's prepared for us. Not only the right preparation, but also you think about we have a shepherd in Jesus who prays for us. Remember what he tells Peter when, when Peter says, you know, I'll never deny you. And, and Jesus says, Peter, Satan's asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. We have a we have a shepherd who prays for us. Not only has he prepared, but he also offers protection through his prayers. Peter, I pray that your faith does not fail. You're going to fail, Peter. Dealing, you're going to fail. But my concern is, is that your faith does not fail. Because, see, when your faith fails, there's, there's no other option. We're all going to fail and make mistakes. We're all going to have problems in our lives. We're going to face things that are going to be difficulties. And sometimes we're going to make the wrong decisions. But Jesus 
prays that our faith will not fail, that we will stay faithful to him. We have the right protection. He offers that um, with his, the staff. He gives us knowledge of um, Satan, the evil one. Be sober, be vigilant, because you're devil. The adversary walketh about, seeking whom he may, desire, he, he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. We think about how the shepherd delivered Paul. When Paul said, man, when I was, when I was before the, the judge, everybody forsook me except Jesus. He, he was there with me. And then he gives us the right provisions. You think about what he has offered to each one of us. Thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runs over. We're going to go through this kind of fast here as we, as we end up, as we close out. You know, it's, it's, the 23rd Psalm is really an account of a full year in the life of a sheep. And so there, there are different things that happen throughout that year. Uh, when he talks about thou anointest my head with oil, uh, again, we talked about the parasites that sheep get. And, and, and the shepherd would anoint them with oil. He would carry that in his bag. And when they would get these parasites, they would, he would anoint their head. And sometimes what they would actually do, um, they would put them in a bucket. And, and, and the sheep are kind of stupid again. They're dumb. Okay? And they would fill the bucket up with this oil. And the sheep would stick his head into the bucket. And guess what would happen to the oil when he'd stick his head in the bucket? My cup runneth over. He would make sure there'd be enough oil in there that all the head of the sheep would be covered. And the cup would run over. See, my shepherd goes above and beyond what he really needs to for me because he cares for me. Think about that in the context of of an eldership or a leadership. They go above and beyond what, what even most people would expect. See, that's a true shepherd. He takes care of those things. The small problems can grow into major headaches. Um, the sheep can get some parasites <clears throat> and they get actually into their ears and into, actually into their brain. And, and sheep will actually, they'll go up to a tree and they'll headbutt that tree because of the immense pain that they're in. And it's, they're trying to get the pain to go away. <laughs> what makes you butt your head against the wall? You know, I, I use the term, you know, sometimes I'm around folks and they'll say stuff and, and I almost want to take a roll of duct tape and duct tape my head so it won't explode. <laughs> um, and I think that's kind of the idea here. The, the things that, that we endure sometimes that we go through and it just makes you want to pull your hair out. You wonder about that. But see, we have a shepherd who, who knows that and, and there is a bomb in Gilead. We do have a, a cure for the things that bother us and the things that we, need to, that we need to have. And then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What, what follows after you? Have you ever thought about that? You know, when, when in Revelation, um, in Revelation 14, 13, it says, Blessed are, are the dead that die in Christ. And then, then it mentions a few things. Then it says, for their works do follow after them. What follows after you? You know, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Well, we look at that in the light of, of our shepherd, and we know that he gives us mercy and grace and all those things, and, and, and the things that Jesus did, it, it, the Bible talks about, he went about doing good. And all the things that, that Jesus did, we can read and we see those, and, and we see what followed after Jesus. A movement that has changed the world, right? But all of the things that we can look at, what about us? You know, do we count our blessings every day about what we have? Do, do, is your health good? You know, are, are your friends, are your friends um, you know, with you and, and they're, they're helping you? And, and, and do you have a great job? Do you count that as a blessing that, that those are things that God maybe has blessed you with? But what about if that's not the truth? Maybe... You know, you're, you're in the, the hospital and, and you're, you're, one of your loved ones is, has had gone into surgery. And you're not sure of the outcome of the surgery. And, and the doctor comes out. And, and typically, if it's okay, you know what he does? He comes into the waiting room and everybody's there and he goes, everything is good. We got it all and everything is great. But when they tell you to go to the little room, it's typically not good. There's typically a problem. What about then? Does his mercy and grace follow after us then? When we get this kind of news. 
do we think about that? And does his mercy and grace stop with him? Or does it follow after me? Can people see in my life when things happen that are not very good? Can they see the Lord's mercy and goodness following after me? Because those that die in the Lord, their works do follow after them. People can look and, 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 and maybe talk about what your life was about. Does his goodness and mercy follow after me? Do I have compassion? Do I forgive others? Do I treat others as Christ treats me? And then lastly, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Unlike sheep, we have a choice where we will dwell. The sheep, if, they're, if they've got a great shepherd, they're, they're bragging about it. They're, they're excited about who they have. But we, as a people, can choose who we follow. And do we choose to follow after Christ? Nothing could make us ever leave his care if we truly understood what we have with our shepherd. I think about Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and, and my points on this lesson where I, I stay planted. Blessed is the man. Y'all know that verse. I stay put because of who my shepherd is. See, there's not another shepherd who can compete with my shepherd. There's not another one who gives me what my shepherd gives me. So because of that, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because I'm going to trust in Him. I'm going to stay contented. See, the things of life don't bring me contentment. The, 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 the monetary, the cars, and that, that, that really is, it doesn't do it for me. When we have the Lord as our shepherd. Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, with food and raiment, be content. But see, a lot of us aren't content with just food and raiment. You know, we have to have all what the Joneses have and the Smiths and the, the Johnsons. We want to have all of that. And in doing that, it, it inhibits my work for the Savior. And then I will stay attentive. You know, there are a lot of people out there with no hope. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. There's a lot of people out there that have no hope. Are we attentive to that? Are we paying attention to those around about us to try to introduce them to the greatest shepherd that has ever lived? And I know we're talking about shepherds in that way, but I want you to think about also the leadership, how it affects the church. If you have the right kind of elders, shepherds, leaders of your congregation, and I know that's something y'all are thinking about and, and you want to grow into. We're doing the same thing at St. Augustine Road. We're, we're pretty much in the same boat. We have four men names who are put forward to become elders. Two have withdrawn their names. So there's two of us left. We want elders because we know that's the biblical pattern. But we want to be the right elders. We want to be the right kind of shepherds that love the sheep like our Lord did. And so it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. I hope these lessons that, that we've done, talked about tonight in this 23rd Psalm will help you have a, maybe a better understanding of the 23rd Psalm. And understand the importance of what we need in, this, in the church as leaders who are leading this way, who take care of the sheep this way. You might be here tonight and not a Christian. And, and, and let me just tell you, and, and I guess as, as much of a bragging way as I can, the Lord is my shepherd. And I'm sorry if he's not yours. But he can be. He can be your shepherd too. If you're here and you're not a Christian, just by simple obedience to the gospel, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and being willing to repent of your sins, confessing Him before this audience and then confessing Him every day of your life and being buried with Him in baptism. It's very simple. And it's kind of unique that God um, put water everywhere. And it's kind of interesting when you talk to people about baptism isn't essential. Um, well, the Bible says it is. It says it's what saves us. 1 Peter 3.21. But when you think about that, how much in the foresight of God did God make water so important to us that we build cities? by streams and lakes and, and all. There's never a shortage. Matter of fact, there's water right behind me. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you can be buried into Christ and walk in newness of life and become a child of His and be one of His sheep. And He'll be your shepherd. Or if you are a Christian and maybe you're not living the way you should and, and you're straying and, and we talked about that, sometimes we have to break a leg. To, to reel that sheep back in, to get that will back in line to God's will. Maybe that's you. If there's any need that you have tonight, if you would come as together we stand and while we sing.